housekeeping uh, announcements. Please note the location of the fire exits. Please switch your mobile phones and other devices off, or at least onto silent. The meeting is being live streamed and an audio recording will be made. And please switch your microphones on when addressing the council or when you have finished speaking. Prayers tonight are taken by the Reverend Canon Lisa Barnett, Team Rector of Bush. Thank you. Our church at the moment is very involved in welcoming Ukrainians into Horsham. And I had the privilege of visiting Ukraine 20 years ago um, and also of spending some time in Moscow. And during my time there, I had the opportunity to learn to pray some prayers in Church Slavonic, the language of the Orthodox churches. And so I thought this evening I would sing the Lord's Prayer in the Ukrainian language Church Slavonic. Oče náš, ty žije si na nebě se, zasvětit se jimě tvoje, zapědit se, zpět tvoje, a budit volět tvoje, jako na nebě si na zemi. Chleb náš nás už nejtáž nám nic, i je stáví nám dolgy naše, jako že i moje stavě jen dožníků i nie vedi nas vo iskušenje, o izbavi nas od lukavago. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Lisa. I don't think I've heard you sung like that before, so. to the meeting this evening. There are two people I would like to welcome as well. Joan Greck from uh, Storrington, welcome, and Clyde Trott from Den, um, who are joining us tonight for the first time. I have apologies for absence from councillors Christine Costin, Ray Dorr, Brian Donnelly, Roger Noel, Jack Sahid, and Chris Brown. Are there any other apologies? Thank you. Item two, there are three sets of minutes to be approved. Uh, and I'm going to move in a minute that they are. There are just two points that I have personally. Uh, on one of the extraordinary council meetings, which is, I think was the 1st of March, um, although I conducted that meeting, uh, I noted that my name wasn't on the attendance list <laughs> and I feel it only right that it should go on um, there and on the 24th of March and this was probably my fault I also conducted that meeting but I note my apologies have been given um, <laughs> it was my fault I did have another meeting which I, I cancelled and, and so attended that one but I, I, I just like those noted um, were there any other alterations to the minutes that you feel should be noted? No, thank you very much. Now, the next complication is that the minutes for the 9th of February uh, can be seconded by Councillor Rowbottom as she was present. Um, and so I'm going to take those three minutes, uh, one each. So the first of February, you're happy to second. If the figures are right, <laughs> I haven't checked all the figures and there's an awful lot of them. Yeah. I'm trusting that they are. All in. <laughs> yes, I'll second those. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm proposing that you're seconded. Everyone agreed? The second meeting, which was the 1st of March, an extraordinary council meeting, um, unfortunately, uh, Councillor Roebutton was not present. Is there someone who'd be prepared to a second those minutes. Yeah. Councillor Vickers, thank you very much. Um, the extraordinary council meeting on the 24th of March. Are you happy to? I'm happy to second it. Thank you very much. Good. Declaration.
declarations of members' interests. Are there any declarations of interest from the members? Oh, yeah, sorry. I didn't, I, I, I'm reminded by the new chief exec. I didn't take an approval, but I, I take it that you did approve of what we did for the minutes. Okay. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Right, okay. Declaration of members' interests. I did see some hands. Councillor Service. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, after taking advice from the Learned Monitoring Officer, um, I'm declaring a personal interest in relation to Agenda Item 13, uh, because we own a property which we rent out in uh, East Sussex, not in the district, not in, indeed in the county, but in East Sussex and in Kent. So uh, we are landlords, and so uh, this is about landlords, so I thought we'd write about uh, declaring a personal interest, not a prejudicial one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Yeah, Councillor Jack. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, like my colleague, um, I declare a personal uh, interest with regard to item uh, 13 on our agenda as a trustee of housing in this district. Thank you very much. Councillor Stanley. I have a um, personal and prejudicial interest in item 13 due to my own arrangements. So I will be stepping away from that. Thank you very much. Councillor Hawke. Um, thank you, Chairman. I also own a property investment company, but none of my properties are within the West Sussex district, so mine is a personal. Anybody else? Not the Jackals. Okay. In that case, if there are no other uh, declarations, thank you very much for those and thank you very much for your uh, assessment of your position and uh, appreciate that. Can I just ask that uh, members do stand so A, um, we can see you and B, hear you as well. Thank you. Um, announcements. I was going to make an announcement about Ukraine, but actually have been forestalled by the, the, uh, the uh, vicar. Um, we are hosting families in this uh, district from UK, Ukraine. Uh, so far, I've heard that there are 19 families being hosted. Uh, and I think that it's, it's worth noting that this district is actually uh, playing its part in looking after uh, these uh, refugees. Uh, and uh, I happen to know that, that uh, Canon uh, Lisa is concerned and involved closely with looking after the, uh, the families who are caring for the refugees. I don't have any other announcements, so that will bring us to the leaders and what. To attend, the, the idea is actually okay. Thanks. The idea is uh, to meet uh, our residents and the whole community. I'm sure there's many an opportunity for us to have uh, our own private conversations. So you don't necessarily have to come, but I don't want to stop you coming as well because uh, it looks like it's going to be a reasonable, enjoyable community event. Uh, especially judging by the uh, over 50 questions we've had already supplied, and uh, so uh, please, be, you're most welcome to attend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, cabinet members' announcements. I have Councillor Bradner. Thank you, Chairman. Just a couple of items to report. Um, first of all, the Reuse Initiative, introduced last August and funded by West Sussex, has now come to an end in Horsham for the time being. Our trial has influenced West Sussex, and we understand they now intend to introduce this at sites across the country, which is good news. 
Uh, we have about 70 items still available to purchase. Uh, and they can be purchased online through our website. And we have had some very nice pieces available. The scheme has saved 193 items from landfill. 176 items were sold. And there are about 45 items were offered to charity. So it was a very good thing. And um, I hope it's going to continue. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, moving on to the Wii Small Electrical Items and Textile Collection Service. And I feel I must pay tribute to my predecessor, Councillor Circus, for introducing this because by any measure it has been an outstanding success story. With over 4,000 household collections made, collecting 21 tonnes of textiles and 11.5 tonnes of small electrical items. Added to that, the introduction of the battery collection service has seen nearly five tonnes of dug batteries, who knew, um, collected. And it really has been first rate. We're currently looking at options available to extend this valuable service. Um, and I just, you know, I've used the service myself. I don't know if members have used it, but it is, it is first rate, it really is. And it's, of course, very good for the environment. Um, last but not least, I wanted to let members know that the council has carried out a lot of work recently to keep our major roads, the A264 and the A24 particularly, clear of litter. Of course, this shouldn't be an issue in the first place because individuals and trades should behave responsibly to make sure they don't litter at all. It isn't good enough for trucks, skip lorries, etc. to be flying through our district, scattering rubbish as they go. When you add that to the private car owners who throw their rubbish out the window, it's easy to see why we end up with such a lot of litter. Going forward, I will be working with our new Head of Service, Laura Parker, to ensure that we take a robust approach to stop this blight on our roadsides. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, last month, the Cabinet agreed the next part of the climate change strategy for the Council. Um, many of you were there in 2019 when this Council voted to acknowledge the climate, um, the climate issues that we're currently facing. Uh, we've already seen incredible process that, progress. The Council has cut its emissions by 30% since then. And the plan agreed um, that Cabinet will cut emissions by a further 30% by 2025, leaving us with a remaining percentage to do before 2030. And I think that's testament to the work of the officers and the, um, the Cabinet team who are pushing this agenda forward. So I thank those involved. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Utah. And Councillor Mitchell. No questions relevant to the business of the meeting from the public, which brings us to item seven to receive any petitions. Uh, the council has been presented with a petition regarding the swans at Southwater Country Park. The petition was started by Amanda Botting, a local resident, and has gathered over 3,300 signatures. And I invite Councillor Jonathan Chown, leader of the council, to make a statement response to the petition. Uh, thank you Chairman. I'm very pleased to accept the petition regarding Southwater Country Park entitled Save the Swans, Remove the Gate. Uh, this petition has received over 3,300 signatures and uh, I have it here so uh, perhaps everyone can go through it and check. And see what... These are people who are really involved aren't they? Best. They should have left their email address even better. Um, uh, by a long-standing local resident in South Water, uh, um, Amanda Botting. It's absolutely clear to me that the swans in South Water Country Park, along with those in Horsham Park, are, are very in, in, important to our wildlife there and here, and deserve the full protection for, for their environment to, to be as supportive and nurturing as possible. I'm sure that you will all agree, South Water Country Park is a real jewel in our district crown. There is a delicate balance between the needs of the wildlife within the park and the human visitors who enjoy this wonderful leisure facility. 
increased. We always look to prioritise the swans and the wildlife to ensure that their needs are met. I know that uh, Councillor Roger Noel, Cabinet Member for Leisure and Culture, is sad not to be able to be here tonight to formally accept the position uh, on behalf of the Council. However, Councillor Noel has met with Amanda, discussed the contents of this petition, and given his personal assurance that the swans will be protected. He is also committed to working closely with Amanda and local residents to ensure that all the ongoing suggestions to enhance the swans' environment are listened to and implemented wherever possible. I'm also very pleased to be able to confirm that the specific requests from the petition have all been reviewed and a solution has been found to ensure a new specially named swan walk <laughs> has been put in place. Sorry, I was going to foul this up on a feature story. I've got the honor of relaxing too much anyway. I was getting into trouble. Has been put in place to make the route that the swans take from the lake and across the beach so much easier. Amanda and representatives from the Swan Sanctuary have met officers on site and agreed to deal to details behind this route and will continue to engage in a regular communication to ensure that the needs of the swans are always, always prioritised. I would like to thank Amanda and the Southwater local residents for their substantial petition uh, and it is clear that local people highly value and deeply care about the swans' health and happiness and our environment. We have listened and acted on your concerns. As leader of the council, I'm absolutely committed to an ongoing enforcement of all our wildlife across the district, and our wild portion district is part of that uh, commitment, and the natural environment. I don't think it's ever been as important in, in to all of us or to our children and grandchildren. We owe that to them all. So across the whole di district, protection of the swans and wildlife in South Wales Country Club are an important part of that commitment. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Councillor Chown, and, uh, and I hope the residents are happy with what has been uh, achieved by their petition. Item 7, uh, pages 35 to 36, recommendations from Cabinet on March the 24th. The first recommendation, Highwood Community Centre Development Proposal, I invite Councillor Josh Potts, Deputy Cabinet Member for Leisure and Culture, to present this item and move the recommendations. Councillor Potts. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to wish Councillor Noel a speedy recovery from the dreaded COVID. As his deputy, I'm pleased to present this report, which sets out the business case for the construction of a new community facility and nursery at Highwood, west of Horsham. As I'm sure members will agree, community centres are a vital aspect of community life as they provide a public space for local residents to gather for group activities, social support and other purposes. I feel that this report fulfils the requirements of setting out the slightly protracted history of this scheme and therefore I don't intend to repeat it all now. However, I would draw Council's attention to the amount of work that has gone into preparing the proposal. This includes a full review of existing community buildings within Den and surrounding areas, the consideration whether Highwood Community Centre might provide a long-term home for the Horsham Amateur and Operatic Drama Society at Hales, a review of daytime users, including nurseries, with the intention of securing an income stream to add daytime vibrancy and create a commercial investment. And finally, a consultation with our local residents. Of course, when it comes to considering new facilities, we need to make sure that we consider as many aspects as possible. And therefore, I feel it is only right that I also draw Council's attention to the financial aspects of the scheme. Again, these are fully set out in the report, but I would ask my colleagues to note that we are making the recommendation to proceed with this, with this scheme on social grounds rather than on its financial merits. Having said that, I do think that on balance, our proposal to provide a new community facility alongside a nursery is the right one. I think it will make a significant contribution to the local community and I think it honours the commitment made when the Highwood development was originally conceived. I therefore ask Council to approve the recommendations as they are set out in the report. That is, to approve the building of a community facility and nursery at Highwood and the approval of a budget of 2.75 million for this purpose 
by allocating two and a half million in 2022-23 and then 250,000 in 2023-24. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Boss. Do you have a seconder for your affirmation? You wish to speak now or later, Councillor? Thank you very much. In that case, the, uh, the debate is open. And uh, does anyone have any comments? Councillor Fletcher. Thank you very much. As one of the local members for Den Ward, where this new community centre is going to be built, I do very much welcome that we are going ahead with this, both the community centre and the nursery. It's obviously been a long uh, route to get here, but this is finally delivering the community centre that was promised and indeed paid for in the Section 106 settlement um, when, the, when the development was started. So um, although it, um, Councillor Potts says this is going ahead on social grounds rather than financial grounds, um, I think that slightly muddies, uh, covers over the, uh, the, the complex trail of the money and the money was originally, uh, much of the money was originally um, donated as part of the agreement for the thing to be set up in the first case. And it's obviously highly necessary that this new community asset develops and children come and grow up and people retire and get older, have a community centre that uh, will form the heart of the new community. Um, it's, uh, I'd like to thank very much the officers for all the work they've done in discussing the details of this and I think we've come up with a very good uh, settlement here. Um, I'd particularly like to point out that um, the thought that's gone into this and the fact that, that we are going to be delivering something that is uh, fit as a modern community hall. So um, there is going to be, uh, we are promised, a lot of storage available so that the various different community groups who want to use it will have a secure base so that they can come back to it and set up easily and efficiently. And that it will also be designed so that it's suitable for meetings with uh, a proper acoustics and IT and projection facilities so that people will be able to have, have good quality meetings there. And I know there's been a lot of attention put into designing the layout so that as cars drive in and out, um, there won't be too much distraction from headlights for the, uh, the neighbouring properties. Um, so all in all, it's, a, it's a, a lovely development and I do welcome the commitments that we've had that um, the council will be helping facilitate uh, the running of this community centre in terms of help giving support to groups to organise this and maybe possibly even moving to some form of community interest company at some point because um, to actually start, kick start things off, we, we have a really valuable role here as a council. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Congratulations on being elected as leader of the um, minority party. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I shall be brief. Um, I just thought I'd take the opportunity to say that I am pleased to be able to see this thing to fruition. Um, as much of my background as a neighbour of Kenistow as, as I can sort of say, I've been following this issue for quite a long time. It's had some ups and downs along the way, but what we've all the uncertainty we've had over the years. Although there was always a commitment there to do it, it, at times it's been far from certain that that would actually be the case. But uh, I, I would acknowledge that um, Councillor Chowan has always been of the view that, um, that this was something that the council promised to do. And um, I'm the first to uh, acknowledge and welcome when a promise is kept. So um, I, I thoroughly support this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Boffey. I was going to let it go, but Martin, thank you for those kind words, because uh, uh, community centres have always been close to my heart, because I got involved with this many, many years ago, and I campaigned for eight years to build a community centre, and it was blooming hard work. And, uh, but uh, that hard work, is there's no, no gain without pay, so it, it was probably worth doing. And I went back for its, um, uh, well, for its 50th anniversary. And uh, uh, and it was good to still see it there. 
And it just brought how it, I've always thought it's so important that when you create a new community, as we have done at High Down, that you have to put infrastructure in there for the community. Otherwise, you're going to have real problems going forward. And uh, so from the very beginning, I just uh, I was open to uh, them being as ambitious as they wanted to be. Uh, and I think there were some limitations on, on, on perhaps how far that ambition should go. But I'm very pleased that uh, not only did we manage to uh, work our way through that rather ambiguous 106 agreement, or I don't think it was, even was a 106 agreement, anyway, financial agreement with the developers, and we've had a few strange ones up there as well. Broad Chief was an even stranger one when you think about the, the football club only had 260,000 in their budget uh, from the development, and we spent over one million pounds to provide a brilliant football club up there. So we do have those challenges, so we must all be aware of that when we're doing agreements with any developers, uh, because I'm sure uh, the money looked all right at the time, but if it's not built fairly quickly, then inflation can kill off some of those budgets. So I'm really pleased that's happened, and also it's worked right across the community on that, uh, with the local members as well, the, the neighbourhood councils and, and the residents. And uh, I, I, I wish this project all the success that it deserves, and for the new community of High Down because I think they've got off to a good start and uh, I wish them all the luck. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you very much, Council. Are there any other speakers? No, uh, Councillor Mitchell. Chairman, it gives me great pleasure to second the report proposed by uh, Councillor Potts. And firstly, whilst on my feet, I also thank uh, Councillor uh, Roger Cromwell for uh, speaking and covering. Um, and uh, I know he very much wished to be here, but he spoke uh, at Cabinet when this came to Cabinet uh, recently, um, he has used some words as Councillor Potts has, and the leader and his Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Bonkey. Um, what I would say that it does show that we're investing in our community. I do recognise um, discussions and fears about um, what's gone before, but an easy option would have been not to proceed. But uh, the debate we had at Cabinet and throughout this process um, has been that whenever we've built communities which have grown very quickly, um, such as um, north of Horsham, uh, of course we've got an excellent hall there uh, on Pontel Road uh, at the Tithe Barn, uh, Wickhurst Green at Broadbridge Heath, uh, Lintot Square, South Water, and of course very recently I had the pleasure of uh, being with other colleagues at the um, opening of the refurbishment of St Peter's Hall um, at um, Blackbridge Lane, uh, is that um, as has been said these halls uh, do provide community hubs uh, for people particularly when there's new communities, growing communities. So throughout the process, and, and I pay tribute to the work that um, our officers and um, Adam Chalmers has assisted in, um, we've had um, extensive consultation, including with potential nurseries um, who, who may be interested, and with scout groups, and the three uh, local ward members, uh, and I include uh, Mrs Hay, who, who of course was a councillor here, and she took great uh, interest in the project, uh, as did, um, of course, the neighbourhood council, and. Uh, some of the other the other two have also had a, a keen eye. So uh, it's been a real collaborative um, effort, uh, and so I'm pleased that we're going ahead. Uh, I do agree with social grounds, as I've explained. So I think for all those reasons, um, it, it, there's difficult economic times ahead, we're told, and um, I think for a council to be building halls um, at this time for our communities is fantastic. So. Um, I think we all look forward to now working on the detail. There is going to be finer detail, um, but that works and uh, hard work now will commence now. So, for all those reasons, uh, Chairman, I um, commend the report to Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. So, you've heard all the, uh, the, uh, the speakers. Um, all those in favour of approving the recommendation on page 35 of the agenda, please show. Any against? Any abstentions? The motion is carried, and uh, we look forward to hearing more about uh, what goes on at Highwood Centre. Seven B on page thirty-five: Developer Transport Modelling Update to Fees Schedule. Uh, I invite Councillor Lynn Lambert, Cabinet Member for Planning and Development, to present this item and move the recommendations. Thank you, Chairman. The Horsham District Transport Model was developed by consultants working for the Council to provide evidence for the emerging Horsham District Local Plan. This is an opportunity to recoup some of the significant cost of this work by making it available to prospective developers for an agreed fee. 
Model access will only provide prospective developers with a baseline technical model. I must make very clear that paid access to the model does not give any advantage over other site promoters in respect of either planning applications or the local plan. Should Council approve, a protocol and a schedule of fees for third party access will be published on the Council's website. This document is appended to the officer report. The fee scale is based on a percentage of the original cost of the model and allows simple and straightforward fee calculation. Following officer's further advice, the model would be available to purchase with immediate effect, should Council approval be confirmed. I therefore recommend to Council that the proposed new schedule of fees with supporting protocols for third party access to the Horsham Transport Model, as set out in Appendix A, be approved. Councillor Lambert, is there a second for your motion? Would you like to speak now or later? Thank you very much. So we have a proposal and a second there, and the debate is open. Councillor Lambert. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a minor point, really, I suppose, but uh, looking at the notes um, accompanying the model it seems it's based solely on motor traffic and doesn't consider sustainable transport at all um, government policy of course requires that sustainable travel should really be at the heart of any any uh, policy uh, planning um, so perhaps it should also be in the model however I note that um, there is the possibility of a stage two model and perhaps we might see some improvements there. I was wondering whether there's any uh, prospect of some hypothecation of the fees to ensure that that stage two model actually occurs. I'd be interested in your members' response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lambert. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor President. Yes, when we, we look at this again, we will be including sustainable transport. It doesn't seem a lot to say, um, Chairman. All I say is I wholeheartedly um, support the second, the, the, the motion, and I'm um, delighted to hear that it will go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. So you've heard the proposal of second. Uh, all those in favour of approving the recommendations on page 35 of the agenda, please show. Thank you. Any against? And any abstentions? Thank you very much. The motion is therefore carried. Item 8 on page 37, recommendations from committees. The first uh, recommendation I have is overview and scrutiny committee, final report of the sustainable travel task and finish group. Uh, and I invite Councillor Tony Beavis, Chairman of Overview and Scrutiny, to introduce this item and then move the recommendations. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, the, the, the Sustainable Travel Task and Finish Group was set up um, last year uh, after a proposal by Councillor Croker. Uh, they've done an awful lot of work behind the scenes since then, um, chaired by Councillor Croker. And I think it's appropriate that he actually introduces the body of this report um, and then we move on from there. So I'll hand over to Councillor Croker. Thank you. I think to start with, I'd like to put a little bit of context perhaps around this. Um, if you look back, particularly the way highways, which have always been for all users, something that's frequently forgotten, way that they were developed, pedestrians have mostly been provided with pavements, whereas the other sustainable travellers, such as cycle users, have by, being large, by and large been left to share with motor vehicles of increasing number, size and speed. Unsurprisingly, some cycle users prefer to use pavements rather than the carriageway, bringing conflict with pedestrians 
as noted by Home Office Minister Paul Boateng uh, in 1999 when he introduced fixed penalty notices. Um, and he said that they're not aimed at responsible cyclists who sometimes feel obliged to use the pavement out of fear of traffic and who, sh who show consideration to other pavement users when doing so. This has recently been uh, repeated by another minister. Uh, also, a, a recent um, national travel survey reported that half of adults will be encouraged to cycle more with safer roads and off-road and segregated cycle paths. So today, the health and environmental downsides to car use for personal transport are well recognised by central government and provision for sustainable travel is encouraged, for example, in MPPF Section 9 and in the recent policy paper Gear Change and its companion local traffic note 1 slash 20 cycle infrastructure design. Most recently, we have the creation of Active Travel England, the government's new funding body and inspectorate for walking and cycling, which will be based in York from this summer with around 100 members of staff briefed to monitor all new road construction and improvements. And the bottom line there is if you don't comply with the standards, you won't get your government money. So turning to the Sustainable Task and Finish Group, um, as Councillor Bevis says, this was formed uh, last year, uh, and basically worked through the summer. Uh, our terms of reference are three parts. Uh, firstly, this council's relationship with the Highways Authority, that's West Sussex County Council Highways. Um, specifically, to look at how sustainable travel infrastructure is specified and implemented uh, using the COVID-19 travel lanes, loved by some, loathed by others, and Horsham's local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, which I'll refer to as LC WIP from now on. Secondly, how are sustainable transport provision proposals evaluated? And thirdly, what internal changes would help this council meet the ambitions of the policy paper gear change. Group discussions were held with both West Sussex County Council and Horsham District Council officers. And I'd like to thank all concerned for the open and informative nature of these discussions with the members of the Task and Finish Group. I'll move now to the recommendations. Um, Essentially, there are four recommendations, although it gets slightly complicated. Um, the first one was that this council considers pursuing implementation of a highway matters screening method similar to that employed by Mid Sussex District Council for planning applications. Uh, the group were advised that this system enables members to input any local concerns and it also enables West Sussex County Council highways to direct their resources to those sites which may need more attention. I think anyone who sits on a planning committee will recognise the potential benefits with regard to highway matters of being able to comment for West Sussex Highways puts in their formal comment. Secondly, uh, the group lists three items for this council to consider. Firstly, that some very specific changes are made to the current proposed Regulation 19, Policy 41 um, in the Horsham District Local Plan Draft. Um, that, that's laid out in Appendix 5 of, the, of our report. Secondly, that a much stronger emphasis on sustainable transport as required by NPPF Para 112, incorporating themes expressed in Appendix 6 of our report, is reflected more in the local plan and in supporting design and other planning policy guidance. In other words, we'd, we'd like the Council to go faster and stronger on that. And the third point um, is that 
any capital investment should really focus on a single LCWIT project meeting LTN 120 standards and the key point being of sufficient scale to encourage people to cycle more, complete trips and to act as a flagship for further routes. We're basically looking for routes rather than local improvements. Thirdly, we would encourage this council to pursue and enable policy and measures to reduce the need to travel, especially by private car, including shifting trips from private car to active travel and public transport, reducing trip length and enabling the option of working from home. I, I think I believe that much of this is, is now in train as part of the Carbon Reduction Action Plan. Fourth, and finally, we would encourage this council to develop and support local groups to produce further LC whips, especially for some of the larger villages across the district. So I hope the council will support these recommendations, which will help it meet its ongoing active travel obligations. I thank you for your attention, and I must conclude by thanking the members of the Task and Finish Group for their time and expertise over last year. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much, Councillor Croker. Uh, Councillor Beavis, I believe that as your chair of scrutiny, you're actually going to sort of um, move the recommendation. And, and is there a second of all motion? I believe Councillor Platt is prepared to second my motion. That's all right. I, I saw two hands go Yeah, Councillor Platt. Yes, thank you very much. Do you want to speak now or later? Since the 1950s, government transport policy has given priority to motor vehicles at the expense of other modes of transport. It has not been a great success, particularly in towns and built-up areas where they have become the dominant means of transport. Motor vehicles are at their least efficient in towns. At slow speeds and stuck in traffic jams, their fuel consumption increases, they give off harmful exhaust gases that are a significant cause of ill health among those who are unfortunate to live and work nearby. And they're a source of constant background noise. Electric vehicles will address some of these issues, but they're certainly not carbon free. And in any case, cars are also an inefficient use of road space. Cars in towns carrying one or two people take up a lot more space than people riding bicycles, and it can be quicker to get around town on a bicycle at busy times than in a car. Buses too are more efficient use of street space. Bus takes up about three times the road space of a car and can carry up to 20 times the number of people. And finally, car parks need a lot more, uh, cars need a lot more parking space with extensive infrastructure in the form of multi story car parks and cycling, cycling parking. It takes up a lot more space and is less expensive. Luckily, it seems that the penny has finally dropped. And the principal sign of this is the government's white paper published in July 2021, Decarbonising Transport, a Better Green Britain. This is backed up by the documents Gear Change and LTN 120, referred to by Councillor Croker, which give excellent practical guidance on just how to implement cycling and walking infrastructure programmes. So although we don't have legislation requiring these changes, we do have some excellent uh, clear guidance and um, the uh, Horsham District Council Regulation 90 Draft Policy 41 is good as far as it goes and we have suggested some minor amendments to the present text but in order to bring it in line with the white paper it will still need more substantial revisions which we have set out in appendix 6 of the document. But at a personal level where I live, I'm very lucky uh, that I can get about to any of the places that I want to go in our community. The shops, the health centre, the pubs, uh, the standing centre, and so on. I can do it all on my bike. Um, the streets are safe and mostly have very little traffic. And it's probably at least as quick as I can get around uh, by car. It's often quicker because I don't have to park the car and then walk to my final destination. I can see that this is not the case of many in this district, particularly living in larger communities, and I would like to see them have the same opportunities 
that I've got. Horsham District is a great place to live. It could be better, and it will be, if we incorporate these changes into our district plan. And they go ahead and implement them. They will open up opportunities for people to get around Horsham safely and easily on foot, by bike and bus, by having a joined up system, safe, well designed, navigable routes. We now have guidance from government on how to do this, so let's put it in our district plan and implement it. So I ask members to vote in favour of this proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor So we've heard the proposer uh, and the uh, seconder. I'm going to throw this over to David and Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, lots of really good suggestions and uh, recommendations in. Uh, uh, to pick just two out, uh, I, I think the, um, the, the Sussex methodology uh, for involving local councillors, local members, um, prior to planning applications is a really, really good idea. Uh, and uh, gives uh, everyone, we all know how difficult it is with planning applications to, uh, to uh, when a lot of analysis is done by desktop, uh, by how it's remotely without any visit to the site. So it gives at least a, an opportunity to put, to put local knowledge into into the uh, proposal beforehand. The second one I'd like to pick out is the um, is the proposal to concentrate on one particular um, route in the in the LC Whip, uh, and I would recommend, as I've done before, the route along Guildford Road, Bishopric, uh, which is where the road space is relatively relatively unconstrained. Uh, I think if we could get that route to work, it would be a fantastic demonstration of what a proper cycling route could mean. Uh, because at the moment we haven't got one, so nobody knows what it is we're, we're trying to propose for. So those two things I would say. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other? Uh, Councillor Burgess. Thank you. I'll just point out we do have a dedicated cycle route towards Tambridge, but it's frankly useless because you have to cross so many side roads. And I came down the other day, I used to cycle along Midworth, I'm now getting a bit old, but that's a good thing before I get an electric bike, like Bruce Fletcher's got. Um, it's badly designed, but it could be very good because that, that road is ideal and has got space for putting proper cycling things. And if you go to Amsterdam or anywhere in Holland, you will see what these routes are, but they have to be joined up. And one of the problems that we had when we were forced by the County Council to introduce uh, a temporary cycle route in Albion Road was it didn't lead anywhere, and it didn't go anywhere, and it didn't start anywhere. So if you're going to put these cycle routes in, which I agree with, you need to have a starting point, you have to have an end point, and it has to be dedicated such that there's no stopping and starting halfway down. Uh, you may get one stop, but you mustn't got like the current route going through to Tambridge. So I just need that when we put forward these things, we need to bear those in mind. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Councillor Burgess. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Crocker for his work on this. Um, I, I'm particularly impressed with the way this has come to Council. Um, Councillor Crocker and the, the uh, Task and Finish group, um, I think there are three Conservatives from Middle Devon Green, have worked in tandem to bring this before us tonight. This has involved several meetings with West Sussex County Councillors, with outside bodies, with, with Horsham Council officers, and the research and um, the, the, the particular uh, council approach that's gone into this is to be commended. Before uh, a council can make a decision, we need to make evidence-based decisions based on, on facts and, and we, have, we have that in gear change, we have that in LCL 120. I particularly like the West Sussex um, model. If we choose to adopt that as a council, it will enable us to red flag planning applications that may have potential highways issues before West Sussex pass uh, uh, you know, a, a desktop exercise and, and we all know how difficult it is to get a planning application refused on planning grounds. Uh, once highways are said, no, there is no issue. So um, that is particularly important. Um, as we, obviously a cycling in our district, our, our policy 41, we were very keen as a working group that that is uh, 
um, what's the word, reworded in a, in a much stricter way to, to incorporate LT and 120 in change. Our officers have pushed back, our officers aren't entirely happy with uh, with some of the wording, but, but as councillors and as, as the leaders of this committee, we are we are committed to cycling um, the environment and walking within our district. And, and perhaps we've been a little bit a, um, a little bit forceful in some of the wording that we'd like in, the, in that policy. But, but that only shows the environmental commitment that this council has towards that. Um, so I, I'd like to urge that, that this is an evidence-based uh, decision that has been months in the planning. I've lost track of how many meetings we went to. There must have been at least ten meetings. Um, numerous members of panels that we interviewed, the officers were consulted on, and uh, that is the way that this council makes informed decisions on, on evidence based so uh, I'm not going to sponsor it. Thank you. Councillor Backwell. Um, I'd just like to make a comment on this, that this is very much uh, you know, a rural uh, basement, it completely ignores the <coughs> situation in say West Children's and Fakum where we don't even have pavements. There's no street lighting. And in the sunken lanes that we have, which we have to negotiate, um, they are a nightmare wherever you are, whether you're a pedestrian, a cyclist or a motorist. And so that you know that side of things has been completely ignored in this report and no recommendations will do anything to write what is a very dangerous situation in the roads around myself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Blackwell. Councillor Fletcher. Thank you very much. Um, a step change in the amount of cycling and walking uh, is government policy. It's also West Sussex policy, and um, HDC also has policy to increase cycling and walking. Um, the reason why is because Increasing cycling and walking can help tackle some of the most challenging issues we face as a society. Improving air quality, combating climate change, improving health and well-being, addressing inequalities and tackling congestion on our roads. It helps in creating better connected, healthier, more sustainable communities, helping deliver clean growth and supporting local businesses. Locally, Transport emissions make up about 40% of all our carbon emissions, and they are something that are remaining stubbornly high, in fact rising even as our other emissions fall. A shift to electric vehicles will play a valuable part in reducing these emissions, but it is only part of the solution, and active travel is a key part that we need to embrace. I am very conscious of Councillor Blackhall's point that cycling is not a, a universal answer for every person, every journey and every location. Um, and that some journeys will need a car, some journeys will need an HGV. But 50%, sorry, 58% of all journeys are under five miles because when we go somewhere we're not just traveling a long distance to work or to see our rel relatives there are trips to post a letter and trips to the local shop trips to school and nursery so 58 percent of all journeys are under five miles and in our urban areas 40 percent of journeys are under two miles and these are the journeys which in particular are causing rush hour traffic queues just look at how the traffic melts away when the schools are on holiday. They're the ones that are causing the polluted streets and the anti-social parking. Some people will need cars. This, uh, the recommendations of the task and finish group do nothing to prevent people who need a car carrying on to make their journeys conveniently by car. But if everyone drives, in the end, no one moves very much at all. Huge numbers of people would like to be able to choose to walk and cycle for more of the everyday short trips they make. This is especially true for those who cannot drive. People who are being squeezed off the road because they're too unsafe for them to use for independent travel and then have to rely on other people to get about for their day-to-day -day trips. This is children and young people. 
increasing numbers of older people who are no longer able to drive because of medical issues, or those who never learnt, those who are caught by the cost of living crisis and can't afford a car, and those with disabilities, many of whom cannot walk but, and cannot drive but could, for example, cycle. The biggest barrier to these journeys taking place by walking and cycling is the way we plan and build our streets, which have over the years squeezed out cycling and now increasingly walking because we see the increased number of children who cannot walk to school because it's not safe and they get driven by Chelsea tractors and probably you also have uh, um, schools in your wards which are really troubled by uh, the gestion and the danger outside school gates. For most people, cycling simply feels too dangerous. So although the positives of the exercise vastly outweigh the risk of injury, it is too dangerous to cycle on our streets. Cycling is only about 2% of trips. Councillor Fletcher, you, you've been talking for a long time. Would you like to um, curtail now yes. what you want to say? Um, so, I'll, um, yes. What I was going to say, the recommendations um, are about the Elswips. I, I particularly um, welcome to focus on the built-up areas where the greatest, um, the greatest opportunity is. And that's not just Horsham Town, but there is great opportunity, particularly in our larger this, um, larger this, larger villages. Um, and the gear change policy and accompanying design guidance will enable us to build things which actually work. What I do want to say is that may not be obvious, is that if we don't embed this in our local policy, we do not have the levers to force developers or even West Sussex to build to these new higher standards because they are not literally mandatory standards. And if we don't build to these new higher standards, as Councillor Croker says, we will be risking our funding. West Sussex has already lost funding due to following, failing to follow guidance. And unless we as the local planning authority strengthen our own active travel policies in our local plan, we risk losing more funding. Thank you. I will endeavour to do this, Councillor. I don't think that's relevant, I think, actually. Um, and I think maybe I'm trying to give everyone a fair go, but I have to take your point. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I would like to um, enforce what um, Councillor Blackwell said. I too live in a well, I live in a rural village, um, and I have to tell you that, in fact, in many instances on these rural roads, um, cyclists actually are causing huge tailbacks, which of course is contributing to um, uh, to pollution, uh, serious tailbacks, which result in a massive, massive, massive frustration and also, more importantly, for, for those that uh, are advocating cycling, the very reverse of what they want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Council. cyclists particularly uh, outside Compton's, uh, outside uh, Forest School on Compton's Lane. And that public consultation only launched uh, on Monday of this week and of course is open to the public um, and uh, closes on the 6th. So that will, um, without prejudging it, but I, I, I do hope um, it would be it would be a project that is welcomed by the public and the um, Neighbourhood Council. But it will be one that um, we hope but actually will make that area safer. We encourage people to cycle uh, not just to and from school, of course, but um, in that area, um, and encourage people um, to use the buses uh, more. Um, 
I think due to the structures that we uh, have to operate within that local government, we have to be tenacious, and that's what I think we have done with West Sussex in ensuring that that particular scheme came forward. So what I wouldn't want is the debate or the public to think that we're not doing enough, because only this week, only on Monday of this week, we had some fantastic news um, for um, highways improvements for cyclists um, only just up the road. So thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Van der Thank you, Chairman. Um, my my uh, question really related just to um, the recommendation little three. Um, the, the wording of it was rather unclear to me. Um, it, it says that the recommendation is for Horsham District Council to pursue and enable policy and measures to reduce the need to travel um, and enabling option of working from home. And it was unclear to me whether that applied to the whole of the population of the district generally, or, or just um, the employees of Horsham District Council. I see the, the reasons um, which are given for the, the recommendation. Um, it does clarify in little three of the reasons that, that it concerns Horsham District Council's own operations. So I understand that it's limited to Recommendation 3 is therefore limited because of that to just um, policies to reduce the need to travel for Horsham District Council's employees. But I wonder if that should be clarified for the sake of um, any officers who may need to carry out the uh, recommendation if it's adopted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perhaps I can come back to Councillor Croker on that and uh, ask for his. Uh to consider their position as it were and what changes they might make to reduce their carbon footprints going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is that satisfactory? Thank you very much. Well yes, uh, please. I only really want to reiterate, Chairman, that half of the population of Horsham District lives in the countryside. And those of us who do need and use our cars and quite frankly as councillor Beckles said most of our lanes are so narrow you couldn't possibly put footpaths cycleways or anything else along them um, and and councillor Yutan's quite right about cyclists in the country lanes i mean you know they, they do cause enormous hold ups and they are dangerous um but i've lived in my village for 23 years i have never seen a bus where am I going to get a bus? And I'm five miles from my nearest shop. I'm five miles from, uh, or six miles from the doctors. I can walk to my pub, but as, an, uh, as a teetotaler, that's not much good to me, really. Um, but the, you know, there is another side to this. I welcome it for the town. I mean, it's a great idea. But when you live in the rural area, you have, people have to accept that we need our cars and, you know, we don't, I don't want to cycle. You know, I, I have told Councillor Fletcher many times that I don't share her enthusiasm for cycling. Um, and I don't think I should be starting now. I don't think I could get five yards, never mind five miles. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Councillor Brennan. Uh, are there any other? Councillor Chow. <laughs> Yes, can I just say, as on behalf of the, uh, the our sort of collective leadership, uh, we do accept this report, and we're totally in favour of looking at sustainable transport going forward. Um, we have got to, we've got issues. That we are we have a town or one town, a few villages, and we have a lot of countryside. And uh, and I have to say that uh, when I'm out walking or cycling or driving, I do find some of the cyclists, especially if they're wearing light clothes can be very challenging um, and uh, whereas I, I'm always saying when I'm on my bike and I have to declare an interest perhaps the monitoring officer put that down that everyone's declaring interest nowadays just in case but we're all interesting and everything but anyway I declare an interest that uh, I like my cycle uh, I keep on promising myself an electric bike 
Um, but I uh, still think I have to pedal a bit more, so I'm keeping going. Um, but we have got to deal with those issues of how we can deal with sustainable transport, not only in the town, but in the countryside. Now, in the town, it will be easier to do it to a certain degree because you will have the volumes, you will have the ability to do it. Uh, in, in, in the countryside, uh, I don't know how we would cope with the West Jiltington lanes and the, uh, and, the, and the sunken roads there. It's difficult enough to drive it. Uh, perhaps a tractor is the best thing to drive one of those roads, uh, because at least uh, people give way to might is right. Um, but otherwise, uh, we do have those issues. I'm not sure whether West Chilterton really wants street lighting. You have to let me know on that, uh, John. Um, I, I'm sort of caught between the two when I live in the countryside. Do I like street lighting or not? But at least it's improving now that people have LED lighting and that sort of thing now, compared to those bright lights that made it look like a landing strip at Gatwick. Um, but we do need um, sustainable transport. And how is that going to be going forward? And it's uh, it's not going to be the combustion engine or the diesel engine, is it? We know that that's not going to be the future. Um, we certainly, from a, a district council, have looking at our sustainability and uh, where we can. We're moving heaven and earth at the moment to move to a sustainable uh, transport, but we can only go so far, and we need to go as fast as technology allows us. And technology is moving very quick. So we've got to bring the infrastructure up to bear on that. And as uh, Peter Burgess has quite rightly pointed out, um, other countries, I can't believe when I first went to the local government in my 20s, being shown uh, what they were doing in Holland. And that's where they clearly, when they built a housing estate, separated the cars from the houses. And there were these separate areas. And that's years ago. And we have done nothing. We are just build, finished building out Broadwich Heath. Well, you have sustainable transport there. You can't park or put a car anywhere in Broadwich Heath. It's much better to walk. And uh, somewhere I read that 45% of Portion residents walk into town. I don't know if that's true. Local people probably don't know whether that's true. So we are there, but we've got to do something. And I do like the idea of the option about the LC Whip having a, uh, a project which could be um, set as a um, flagship development. And uh, certainly I've already put it down in a note when I speak to the chairman and leader of West Sussex County Council, but I put that at the top of my agenda to have a word with him because we have to work in partnership with them. Because the idea that went off uh, during the lockdown uh, was too late. When it came, all it did was cause disruption and put back cycling in the town. By, by a generation, practically, it was so badly done. Um, but there are some good way, work that done by Elsie Whipping, by uh, Peter Burgess when he was doing it. Um, so that I want to take forward. So we are committed as a district to do that. We do understand the challenges between urban and rural, and uh, we, we, we need to work with our partners. So I hopefully, um, Councillor Croker and, and those, and, and Councillor Ruth Fletcher uh, will join us in. Uh, how we tease that forward. I'm not quite sure how I see that, but my starting point is going to be speaking to uh, the leader of West Sussex County Council and see if we can come up with a flagship project because I think we're committed to find an answer for these things and fairly rapidly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Chow. I take it there are no other comments. Um, you heard the arguments uh, and, uh, and the uh, proposer and seconder. So, all those in favour of approving this recommendation on page 37 and 38, please show. Are there any against? No abstentions? Motion is therefore carried. Thank you for your uh, the, uh, participation in that debate. It's quite sandwiched. Item 9 on pages 39 to 46, the water neutrality resourcing, and I invite Councillor Lynn, Lynn Lambert to uh, present this item. Thank you, Chairman. As all members are no doubt aware, Natural England requires that development in the Sussex North Water Resource Zone, which is all of Horsham District, and most of Crest, Crawley Borough, and parts of Chichester District in the South Downs National Park, to demonstrate that it does not increase the use of mains water. This is known as water neutrality. 
the requirement is placed upon us to ensure... Can we turn the light? It's on. Well, the, the can't hear you that side. It's definitely on. Sorry. I'm not very tall. <laughs> Come sit, please. Yeah, as you said. Yeah. Right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. The requirement is placed upon us to ensure that we minimise harm to the internationally protected species and habitats of the Aran Valley. We are the first area of the country to be affected by this issue. Work is ongoing to deliver the water neutrality solution. The work is, however, resource intensive and takes up significant officer time across the affected authorities. The work also involves liaison with third parties who are key to delivering the solution. These include Southern Water, Natural England, the Environment Agency and Government Departments. This is taking officers away from their roles and commitments. All affected authorities have identified that they require additional resourcing to support the work additional workload that has been generated by the requirement for water neutrality. We are fortunate that West Sussex County Council has been awarded a grant of £100,000 from the Local Enterprise Partnership on behalf of the councils in the Sussex North Water Resource Zone. This funding is to enable the recruitment of essential staff to assist in the delivery of the necessary water neutrality mitigation strategy. The affected authorities have agreed that it is appropriate for a district or borough support any post as the primary purpose of the water neutrality mitigation strategy is to unlock the delivery of the local plans. And the provision of much needed affordable housing, which is not a West Sussex County Council responsibility. As Horsham District is the largest geographical area affected by water neutrality and is also the central authority within the Sussex North Water Resource Zone, it is considered that this authority is well placed to host the additional posts to ensure that all authorities are well served by the role. The detailed costs associated with an initial project manager post are set out within the body of this report. To support any new post, it is necessary for this council to agree an upfront budget of £100,000, which we will then reclaim from West Sussex County Council as they will receive the funding from the LEC. Given the urgent requirement to secure an additional resource, it is considered that agreement to enable recruitment to take place is required immediately. I therefore recommend the Council agree an expenditure budget of £100,000 in 22-23 to enable the recruitment of a water neutrality project manager and other support staff which may be required and the income budget of £100,000 from West Sussex County Council that is sourced from the LEC. In effect, there will be no cost to this Council. It is purely to give us the funding to recruit to these roles. We will then recoup this money from West Sussex County Council's funding from the LEC. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Lambert. Uh, I believe, Councillor Chown, you're something you want to speak now. Or... In that case, we'll make it to Councillor Beavis. Thank you, Chairman. I welcome uh, Councillor Lambert's report, and I, I fully support this role. However, I'm very concerned at the way this has come to Council. This, this proposal hasn't been to Cabinet, it hasn't been to feedback, it's not on the agenda as urgent, and it's being brought by the um, Cabinet Member for Planning and Development, although we're talking about a budget and an a, a establishment issue. I just don't understand how we can be here tonight discussing this in this way. It just, it just show me anywhere in, in our constitution and our standing orders that we should be doing it this way because I can't see it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you.
but in order for that money to come into this council, we need to ask for council for a budget code for that to be paid into. So it is nothing untoward is happening. Um, this is an appointment by the uh, head of paid service, the chief exec. Um, the money will be recouped. There is no money going out. But in order for us to um, have that money and use it correctly, um, we have to come to full council. It's within the constitution. Um, and the governance committee will be looking at that um, in order for, you know, for us to not keep coming back every time we need a budget code. Um, but I can assure this uh, meeting that it is all above board and well within our constitution. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. come back on that. I, I, I still don't understand why this didn't come to Cabinet and didn't go to BDAG before it came to this Council, because I can't see anything that is super urgent. Um, while I'm on my feet, can I just make a, an aside, really? It's a shame that Councillor Donnelly isn't here tonight. He's been pushing for over a year to have a consultant appointed for our off-street parking policy, and it's got absolutely nowhere with it. And I spoke to him about this the other day. And he's absolutely livid that we, we're, we're appointing an officer here for, for this role, and we've still totally ignored the role for off street parking. So, um, just put in a plea for Councillor Donnelly that we should be treating all of these issues equally. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Burgess. Councillor Burgess. Thank you. Um, I know that we're talking about a specific issue here, but we've really got to think very carefully about water, because water in the south of England, it's not just our area, if you look at other areas of well, well is a problem. When I lived in London uh, years ago, uh, we got to the point in 1976 where we had standpipes only, and that's very inconvenient if you want to go to the loo quite often because it's the only way of doing it. Now we put forward all sorts of ideas about how to assist with water and I know I'm going slightly off piste here but it's just something that we brought up year after year after year about getting grey water, black water, whatever you want into houses. We can't do it, no we can't force it. You can pretty much make it an almost essential part of planning if you do it properly. So that's something we need to get in. The next thing is Southern Water, who serves us, have got an appalling, sorry, I'm now pinching your speech, Jonathan, um, but they have an appalling record. Send the mic sorry? <laughs> they, they have an appalling record of leaks and if Southern Water did even half of their leaks, we wouldn't have a water problem. But the problem is much bigger than that. The number of houses where people live tends to be in the south of England. If you live up in the north of England, there's no shortage because I quoted the last time I was here, for instance, the Kielder Dam was built in the 70s because of the proposed extension to Teesside and how much more water they would use for their manufacturing. Of course, it didn't happen. The Kielder Dam, actually, we're exporting water to a mountain. I think there's, there's uh, ships that go out there. So in 1976, when we had a huge problem, the Labour government in force then gave us a Minister of Drought. I'm trying to think of his name, but it doesn't matter. And he went into all of these areas. In fact, he was so successful, in inverted commas, that shortly afterwards he had to be made the Minister for Flooding. But that's a separate issue. But one of the things that came through was, could we look at somewhere some to shift the water from the north down to the south? And there were there were great ideas about huge pipelines, but somebody came up with an idea about using existing water, uh, sorry, what's the right word, water structure, canals and uh, rivers, to divert the water, some of the water, not only some of the water, uh, through to the south. So, one, let's get southern water 
agreeing to fix their leaks? Two, can we please push forward ideas besides putting solar panels on your roof to encourage our developers to put grey water systems in there, which is easy and cheap if it's done with new houses. And longer term than that, can we start to push our government to look at the overall structure from Scotland through Wales down to the south to get more water in the south? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Burgess. Are there any other? Yes, Councillor. Oh, yes, Councillor Mitchell. Jem, thank you. I, I did just want to make sure I'd understood that head of team, because I heard Councillor Bender speak and perhaps expect to disagree. But it, it's quite clear that it would be inappropriate to let you not be the prosecutor of the matter, because I understood it to be a big thrust in this matter had come to light. This is actually the property manager, um, and constitution provides, of course, that the budget comes from the government of the council. Um, and this is essentially a neutral line item as the is coming from another source, but because it's coming in and going out, the council has to approve it. If it had gone to cabinet, that would actually be wrong, possibly unlawful. So we are dealing with this the right way in terms of the constitution. In terms of the need for the role, of course we need uh, a role, I mean, I'm, I'm welcome that uh, we're not going to be um, having wide-scale mass housing development uh, and water neutrality has assisted in that, but uh, we do need to find some, um, some solutions because clearly uh, businesses uh, local people uh, will need uh, and will want, I'm sure, to be able to have extensions. And, and we can't literally um, cover ourselves in um, sort of pull up the drawbridge and say there can be no development full stop ever, ever. So we do need to have this role, um, but I wouldn't want it left thought that it's been wrong or improper to come to council this way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Cabinet Member, for uh, this paper tonight. Uh, my questions are rather more uh, direct than my colleagues, uh, Councillor Burgess. Uh, this money, first of all, I should perhaps declare an interest as being the West Sussex County Council on this matter, and one or two of my colleagues may also like to think that, as, uh, would think to make that statement as well, bearing in mind the money is coming from the passport from LEM. Sussex. Can I just ask a question? Uh, this money is going to be used for gaining support staff uh, to uh, deliver a water neutrality mitigation strategy. From all I've heard, that is quite a task that they face to do, uh, to undertake. Um, the £100,000 has been granted for the financial year 22-23. Do we anticipate that if the mitigation uh, strategy is not possible to be formulated and agreed uh, by the end of this financial year, that this council will be able to gain further uh, funding uh, from the LEP or other external so uh, sources so that the work can be completed. Thank you. Yes. We are in the throes of trying to get money out of the government. Areas that have been affected by nutrient neutrality have received government funding. So far, we haven't got it from them, which is, we've got the money from LEP, but we will carry on trying to get the money from government. But we will find it from someone. Councillor John, did you want to come back? Just to say, I was very pleased to hear that news, Joe. Are there any other? Uh, yes, yes, sorry. Clive. Uh, thank you. Uh, excuse me of being the new boy. Um, but uh, actually, I think Councillor Jupp has just sort of, to a degree, started my thunder, which he's perfectly entitled to do. Um, my concern was about the longevity of the post. Um, if you appoint now in 12 months' time, uh, and the political landscape might have changed, or people have changed their minds that this is not important anymore. What happens? Do uh, Horsham District Council get left holding the baby, um, having employed someone, and then not getting the backup funding in response? So, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Burgess for his point. Having had some experience of utilising grey water in hotter and drier parts of the world than here, um, it, it is the key tool you have for tackling drought. Thank you. 
very much. of the appointment is um, to try and arrive at a, um, a, a water neutrality litigation strategy. Um, Councillor Burgess has, has um, suggested a couple of ways in, in which that might be added to or suggestions for that. And I'd just like to just very briefly throw in another suggestion, and that is that running through the affected area, the, the Arun Valley, is a river called the Arun, and in the 70s the banks of the Arun were built up to stop it flooding, and that's, I think, one of the problems, um, that the area is now suffering from lack of water, and, and a simple remedy would be to, to, to remove some of those banks and to allow it to flood. It wouldn't affect people because those um, the, you know, the Amberley Wild Books, which I look, at, look out, out onto where I live, and the Pulgra Wild Books, they are um, used just by sort of creatures, birds, wildfowl. Um, and that, that noticeably this, this last year, they have been very scarce, particularly birds. And I would suggest that that is, a, a, is a, something to add to the strategy to remove the banks and allow the flooding. Leader, <clears throat> I really put down that I wasn't going to do my speaking tonight, but this has led me into a, another question. Um, one, um, Councillor Bevis, I can't even believe your question to us tonight. Did you want to equate um, off-street parking when we just talked about having a sustainable transport system and wanted to deal with that? You want to deal, want to equate it with dealing with water quality, the very water. I need, I know. Uh, Councillor Donnelly has been fixated about this problem for years, and I think when he started about, he had a lot of support. But the world has moved on, and the fact that we're not going to be having the cars in the future that we had in the past has been made absolutely clear to us by government and policies. And uh, the point is, is that the whole issue is so serious. It is so serious. And we have brought it straight to council, because that is the correct way of doing it, but also because it's such a serious issue. I don't care what the bureaucracy is, we need some money because our officers and myself have been overwhelmed by dealing with water neutrality because we're actually being slowly drawing into it. Not only are we dealing for it for West Sussex and for Horsham District, but we're actually the template for the whole country. And uh, there is a letter that I should have signed on Monday, which is going to the Secretary of State, Michael Gove, asking for this additional funding that Lynn has talked about. Uh, but it has been held up slightly because all the other counties and districts in the county want to put their logos on the bottom of the letter because they've seen the letter. So that they're going to do <coughs> because more the merrier. I wanted to increase the money because our, our problem is more serious. Well, no, it's not. It's more obvious in a way than the nutrients policy problems. But the problems we've got with our water is nutrients, really, followed by... by phosphates and nitrates and the impact this is having on our water supply is huge it, in fact i have now attended 10 hours of webinars on this i'm not an expert because i don't have the the background or the scientific background which you slightly need or the ecological background but after 10 hours i haven't seen a glimmer of light of how we're going to deal with it you would think i would have seen something that would give me some hope that we can deal with it. And I can't see that. They talk about mitigation. Peter, you were right. They did, didn't they? 10 years ago or 20 years ago, when we were having uh, that last drought, uh, they were going to pump water from the north down through the rivers, down through the canals. And they were really fixated. They had a flood czar to help us out with all this issue about dealing with the water. And then it rained. And of course, the problem went away. But it didn't really, because what we had is a lack of investment in our infrastructure. Too much development meets climate change. And it met it at Corporal Brooks. And it manifests itself in a tiny slab. But the problem is really so big and so crucial to our sustainability 
that we've talked about so many times, that it is a very big issue. And to help myself and those hard-pressed officers, Emma Parks is now being uh, seconded to help on the lead uh, committee for DEFRA on water neutrality. So we, we are on the cutting edge because this is just such an important issue. But there will be an opportunity where I can talk to you about it in detail when I have the more and also I've had someone to help me. Um, but uh, we must get this 100,000 through. We will get the other additional money and we will add funding. And I'm sorry, we're not going to solve this in 12 months time. This is going to go on for a long time because the time scales these people show me, they all start in 26 or 27 start and they're talking 2050 and 2060. Are we going to go along this, that sort of time scale? So this is a story that is going to continue and it's going to be really important to all of us. So thank you, Chairman, and uh, please, members, support this wholeheartedly and don't have any, uh, you know, staining or voting against this. This is really serious. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, we've heard the arguments and uh, the proposal and seconder. Therefore, uh, you have an opportunity to vote. And so would you favour, show us all those in favour, uh, show your hands. Please. Are there any abstentions? And are uh, any against? Thank you very much. The motion is therefore uh, carried. So we had one abstention. Did we just? Okay. Item ten on page forty-seven to fifty: appointment of interim director of resources and a section one five one officer. <laughs> and I vote by Councillor Tony Holcomb. Um, Member for Finance and Member of the Employment Committee to introduce this item. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, it gives me pleasure to present this. As, uh, as the Chairman said, I, I recently sat on the Employment Committee, um, which is balanced uh, with, our, with our Chairman, um, the Leader of the Opposition, um, myself, and several other councillors that were seconded onto that panel. Um, it is a legal requirement that we have a Section 151 officer um, in the promotion of. Um, Jane Eaton to our Chief Executive Commission, that, that role is vacant and unfortunately as Council, I think it's under the 1970 Government Act, we can't have this position vacant, we need a formal, um, this is a, a, you know, a must have a Section 151 officer. Um, Dominic Bradley um, is, is qualified for this position, uh, very experienced, he come with a, with a strong recommendation from our outgoing Chief Executive um, and our, and our um, incoming Chief Executive, but uh, it, it is not at their pleasure, it is at the pleasure of you as Council and the Employment Committee to make that appointment. So there are four recommendations in front of you this evening to be approved um, on page 45. Um, there is more background about Dominic uh, Bradley. I'm just trying to say from a personal point of view, I've worked with Dominic for the last um, six months since November quite closely. I think other members of the, uh, the, the, the finance PDA um, know him very well, and uh, I, I trust he'll do a very good job. So uh, I'd like to uh, make some praise on Thank you very much, Councillor Walker. Councillor Ritchie, I believe you're seconding, is that correct? Would you like to speak now or later? Later. Thank you. Uh, in that case, uh, this is for discussion. Um, and I open the floor. Councillor Burgess. Sorry, like our leader, we uh, seem to be talking more than I thought. But one of the things I'd like, which hasn't been said, is that we said a long time ago in Cabinet and elsewhere that we were that we should be much more active about uh, promoting people we've trained internally. Uh, we're very lucky that, Madam, that you are now the Chief Executive. Just note down, you know, don't mind knowing, but just... <laughs> <laughs> But we have somebody who's worked here some time. I've dealt with him. I've known him to be very efficient. Uh, I see that he's already sitting in Jane's office, but under 151, we've got to formally approve it. So I would strongly support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Burns. Councillor Sims. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I fully support the recommendation. Um, but I can't help noticing, as members will have noticed, that we've lost uh, uh, a very able Chief Executive. Uh, we're going to lose a 
very able uh, director of community services. And uh, I remember from my time on the county council, the loss of senior staff can suddenly become a habit. Um, and uh, I think that would be a tragedy because one thing I know from my experience uh, on this council is that we are extremely blessed with some very able uh, and outstanding chief officers and senior staff. And we could not function as a council. We could not achieve anything as a council without their active support. And they have been a huge support to us. And we're very lucky to have them. And I hope the leader, uh, I hope the leader uh, and the chief executive, I know they will, uh, will do their best to make sure that uh, uh, we won't uh, be seeing any more departures anytime soon, hopefully. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Lund, you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, in my short but very interesting uh, spell as uh, Cabinet Member for Finance, I too had um, dealings with Dominic. And I fully recommend uh, his appointment. I think he's very able and a very knowledgeable person. I could uh, give it a point five mark easily. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. Um, as an ex cabinet member and leader, I have worked extensively with Dominic um, and found him to be very supportive, very accurate very good at his job. Um, the new chief executive needs a big hole to fill. I'm sure that Dominic will at least fill her shoes um, to the best of his ability and I'm sure that he will rise to the occasion and I'm sure he'll do well in his uh, post and I totally support this motion to council. Thank you. Thank you very much Councillor Clark. side of the aisle, I was somewhat uh, suddenly thrust into the budget process at the start of this year and uh, I worked quite a bit online with, with Dominic and um, just three words, uh, professionalism, skill, integrity, and that's ways, so I've got my nod as a support for that. Thank you very much. Well, if I can thank uh, Councillor Serkis on his kind words, we could, <clears throat> unfortunately I can be replaced quite easily, but for replacing senior officers is much more difficult. And, and I think uh, what we should be very pleased about, though, is, is our track record. Uh, all, all those who've been leaders over the last 15 or 20 years, the last two chief executives retired, and I don't think we should stop them doing that. And <clears throat> we've actually uh, created uh, one, two, two other chief executives from our team, which I think says, says something about your organisation, is, is that yeah, from your, you've created people who can go on in local government. So it is other authorities' uh, gain and our loss, um, but uh, we're, we're self-generating them internally, which is what's been pointed out to. And it's great to have Dominic, because he was, he's still so young. I mean, they're all so young now. It's, it's horrible. But, but we've also got Barbara, who's, who's also self-created by us at HDC. So we're very blessed, and you're absolutely right. Uh, it's, it's a whole team effort. So I will say to all members that the, the team we have is the team we created, the team we appointed, and the team we work with, and the team that look after us. Just remember that. Thank you very much. I don't think there's anybody else. Councillor Richie. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Let's be my pleasure to work with Dominic since he came to Horsham Council, which was uh, you remember about seven years ago. You might be surprised to learn that Dominic has 20 years of experience doing how you think he works. <laughs> whether, whether that continues to be the case, whether he starts to acquire some grey hair, shall we say, and to not only speak wisdom, but to look like wisdom as well, we shall see. Um, but the recommendation enjoys my um, wholehearted um, approval. Essentially what we're doing is we're appointing the best person available for the role. Um, there's a process to be followed after this appointment, um, but right now, uh, in my
my view, Dominic is the best person for the role, and that is very much consistent with how we have traditionally managed the best part of this process. Thank you very much, Councillor Reid. So you've heard the, uh, the, uh, the plaudits and you've uh, got a recommendation. Those in favour, please show. Any against? Any abstentions? No, not at all. The motion is therefore carried. What I would say to Dominic is it might be better we go now when you've heard all these wonderful things. <laughs> uh, item 11 on pages 51 to 54, appointment to the independent remuneration panel, and I invite Jane Eaton, the chief executive, who I don't think I did actually sort of welcome, but I'm going to welcome you now as chief executive in your own right, and um, you're going to present this item, so thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, stand up. Is my chair going to move? Right. The Council is required to appoint an independent remuneration panel of at least three people to review members' allowances every four years. One of the current panel has had to step down because he has become a Council officer in our own Democratic Services team. The full review of, of members' remuneration isn't due until 2025, but the, the, the panel meets each year to carry out an interim review, so Council does need to fill this vacancy now. Officers identified a suitable candidate and Councillors Jonathan Chowan, Louise Potter and Lim Lambert interviewed her and recommended her appointment to me. Following this in interview, I recommend that you delegate to me as Chief Executive to appoint the interviewed candidate, Cynthia D'Amico, to sit on the independent remuneration panel. I also recommend that you allow me to pay all members of the panel a small sum of money for their work and expenses for the interim review. The detailed recommendations are on page 51 of your paper. Um, I'm glad that the um, panel managed to find a, a suitable candidate and a, a, a well-balanced panel. I think it's just a little bit unfortunate that members didn't have any sort of CV of the proposed appointee, so we don't really know who this person is, which I think is just a, a little bit... Uh, with Dominic's appointment, we did have a, a brief CV at the end of the recommendation. And I think that was a, a useful little aid memoir for us. And I'm, I'm disappointed that we haven't on this occasion. Thank you, Council Vivis. Did anyone, did you wish to respond to that? Anyway, she's appointed, isn't she? Or we will be appointing. Yeah, okay. I don't think it's enough to perhaps, yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. I think the, the, the point really for council members to bear in mind is that there's a, a senior panel who met this lady and they will have seen the CV at the time. And I don't think we can run this council on the basis that we all get to see all of the documents. And so I'm very happy to take the recommendation that's made on the basis that proper due process has, has occurred on behalf of all of us. Thank you very much. I, 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 I Are there any against? No abstentions. Thank you. Which moves us to item 12. Uh, I'm looking forward to this one, to, to hearing about the Southlands National Park. The Council of Andalou. Over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, I, I have the honour to be the, um, this Council's appointee on the South Downs National Park Authority. And of course, um, when I sit on that authority, I'm I'm representing the South Downs National Park and not, not the interests of the Hutford Horsham District Council. Um, and I have three matters that I just wanted to report to you about. The first matter is that the South Downs National Park Authority has submitted a response to National Highways 
statutory consultation on the A27 Arundel bypass, which closed on the 8th of March 2022. A little bit of background about that. In October 2020, National Highways, which was formerly called Highways England, announced their preferred route for a dual carriageway bypass of the A27 around Arundel, which was option 5B version 1, known as the Grey Route. This followed on from the South Downs National Park Authority's successful judicial review of the previous preferred route, which was option 5A version 3, which would have run in part through the park. The Grey Route comprises an eight kilometre stretch of dual carriageway bypass of the A27, diverting south from the A27 at Tai Lane to the west of Arundel and continuing southeast around Binstead Woods before heading northeast across the Arun Valley floodplain to join the A27 again at Crossbush to the east of Arundel. This route is entirely outside the South Downs National Park. This was a statutory consultation by National Highways prior to them submitting an application for a development consent order under the Nationally Significant Infrastructure Projects process. The main purpose of the consultation was to comment on the likely environmental effects of and the envisaged mitigation measures for the route. The South Downs National Park Authority submitted a response which whilst welcoming the avoidance of direct incursion into the park, raised significant concerns about the adverse impact on the setting of the park in respect of landscape character and views into and out of the park, as well as concerns about the impacts on wildlife and biodiversity. It is expected that national highways will submit their application to the inspectorate for examination later this year. The second matter I'd like to mention, Chairman, is the response that the South Downs National Park Authority has submitted to the government consultation on the Glover Landscapes Review, which closed on the 9th of April 2022. A little background on that. In May 2018, the government announced that a review would be undertaken into the role of national parks and AONBs in England. The scope of the review covered, amongst other things, the statutory purposes of national parks and AONBs and how these aligned with the government's 25-year environment plan. Julian Glover chaired the panel which carried out the review and their landscapes review, known as the Glover Report, was published in September 2019. This made some 27 wide-ranging and sometimes radical proposals for shaping the future of national parks and AONBs. The long-awaited government response to the Glover Review was published as a consultation document in January 2022. I took part in a task and finish group which contributed to formulating the S and South Downs National Park Authority's response. The authority broadly welcomed the ambition of the government proposals, but felt there was a missed opportunity in the absence of proposals to help national parks take the lead on nature recovery and tackling climate change areas on which the South Downs National Park considers it has already done a huge amount of work. DEFRA will analyse all the responses before considering its next steps. Chairman, the final thing I wanted to mention to you was progress on the shore and cement works area. Actually, that was a little bit closer to home. Um, as you know, I, again, I've, I've been on a, a, a working group which has been carrying out the work of drafting the Area Action Plan 
and I'm pleased to say that we have now made progress with that and have drafted a version called the Issues and Options version, which um, will be considered by the Planning Committee, I believe, at its meeting in May, with a view to going out to consultation for eight weeks starting in June. The Aerial Action Plan will be the development plan for the Shoreham Cement Works site. Um, and its purpose is to guide the development of this exceptional site and deliver an exemplar mixed use development. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> I think it's encouraging about the um, spotting. spotting the uh, item 13 is a notice of motion. Can I just say before we start? Um, I'm, I'm going to give half an hour maximum for this. Uh, I expect I expect councillors to speak for a maximum of five minutes only, and um, we will see how how it develops. But I just want those two facts known. Uh, we've received a notice of motion in accordance with Rule 4A26 of the Constitution. I invite Councillor John Milne to present his motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this motion is intended to help us achieve two things. Firstly, to improve our ability to reduce unnecessary emissions as a result of poor insulation and energy standards in the private rented sector. And secondly, as one step in the battle against fuel poverty. It's often those in the poorest quality housing who are least able to afford the ballooning energy costs we're all facing. Um, so we must consider every action at our disposal. But first, some background. Immediately after the 2019 HCC elections, the Lib Dem group moved a motion to declare a climate emergency. However, the majority group declined to pass that motion and instead amended it to a vaguer statement noting that people are concerned about climate change along with other issues. What precisely was meant by that has never been clear. Nevertheless, since that time, progress has been made on reducing emissions in the council estate, by which I mean the buildings, vehicles and other areas under our direct control. This is positive, but of course it accounts for just a small fraction of total emissions in the district, just 2 or 3 percent, as the Cabinet Member for the Environment has himself noted. Net zero emissions for the Council do not mean net zero emissions for the district, not even close. However, minimal progress has been made on the larger tasks since 2019, in fact it's fairly often been mentioned. Just because we lack direct control, that doesn't mean we're powerless. As a council, we have the capacity to influence, inform, and persuade. Or to put it another way, to show leadership. This motion proposes to use the levers that we do have to reduce emissions in the private rental sector and at the same time help alleviate fuel poverty. Now, I have received feedback in recent days that this motion could require a change in council policy and motions can't do that. But how true is this? Surely it's already Council's policy to reduce emissions everywhere, whether or not they're under our direct control. If that's not our policy today, I'd like to know why not. Furthermore, the issue has been raised that the motion might require the cooperation of the County Council in areas where they have authority and HTC does not. This is a reasonable point. And if necessary, I'm happy to amend the motion to include the qualification work with the County Council to reduce emissions, or some similar phrase. Finally, I realise that just as our climate emergency motion was watered down, so it has been a regular tactic for the majority party to use procedural means to prevent almost any opposition motion from being discussed in its original form. For example, by referring the issue directly to a PDAC group without further debate. If that were to happen again today, I feel this would be a missed opportunity and a shame, because I brought this motion so that our residents could see their council debate and take action on an issue which is of great importance to so many of them. It's three years since we committed to pushing for lower emissions. That's a long time to make little or no progress on non-council action. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Mill. Uh, that's five minutes, that's well done. Uh, who's your seconder? Councillor Olsen. I prefer to speak now. I'm also speaking this evening in support of this motion. Um, we currently find ourselves facing both a cost of living crisis and a climate emergency, or perhaps I should say climate issues and others would prefer, but either way, both of which are undeniable. Rising energy costs are both directly and indirectly impacting our residents. This motion, I feel, has three broad aims, all of which we as a council can play a part. One, to ensure that private landlords improve the energy efficiency of their properties, often benefiting those most at risk of fuel poverty. Two, helping our residents to access funds to insulate their own homes. And three, making sure we only approve and build the most energy efficient homes we can, once house building resumes, of course. So let's look at the state of homes across our district. According to national figures, energy consumption is falling in industry, services and transport, but increasing still in the domestic sector. Therefore, we must continue to make domestic energy use the most efficient it can be. Energy usage is rated according to Energy per Performance Certificate, EPCs. In Horsham District, the medium energy score for all dwellings is just 67, which puts them in Band D. Or in other words, as of the end of last year, 55% of all dwellings in Horsham District did not have an EPC of Band C or above, as we are targeting in this motion. The story is better for new builds, with 97% at band C or above, but new homes have the potential for the greatest energy performance. We should still take the opportunity to drive these even higher by requiring the highest eco-building standards in the new local plan. Why should any homes not be band A? Looking at existing Horsham district dwellings, the news is not so good. Less than a third had an EPC band of C or greater. So this is where encouraging our residents and facilitating their access to funding and grants to better insulate their homes should be a priority for this council. So finally, why specifically target privately rented dwellings in this motion? Well, again, ONS data shows across England, when property tenure is taken into account, private rental properties emerge as the tenure that has the lowest energy efficiency scores. Looking specifically at ONS data again, for Horsham District shows 66% of existing privately rented dwellings in Horsham had an EPC band below C. Rental prices in the Southeast are second only to London, and on the cost of living crisis, it's clear that tenants have little wiggle room to pay for energy cost savings themselves. They have few options other than turning off the heating completely. Private landlords have the responsibility to make their properties energy efficient for the sake of not only their tenants, but the community at large and the planet. Together, as a council, let's make Horsham a leader in energy efficient homes. Thank you very much, Councillor Olsen. Those are the two statements, a proposal and a seconder. Uh, I'm throwing this open for debate and uh, the first speaker. House of Service. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, this is obviously, uh, and, and I accept it's a very uh, serious and uh, very uh, intelligent uh, approach to to this issue, but I, I'm afraid, I'm sorry to tell Councillor Milne that I have two serious problems with it, which will mean that I can't support it. The first problem is this, that in a way, this is completely the wrong time. Why do I say that? Because the government are proposing to set up a system of regulation and registration of private landlords. England is the only part of the United Kingdom that doesn't have that system and the government intend to do it and they intend to put the responsibility on local authorities and with that will come a power of regulation of pr the private landlord sector uh, uh, as consequent to the whole business of registration. So if, if, uh, if Councillor Milne could be patient the government intend to give local authorities the very powers which would enable them to move on some of these issues a great deal more effectively than they can 
now. So that's the first point. So the timing is wrong. Um, the second point is is this. Uh, the motion talks about alleviating fuel poverty. Now, I don't know whether we're serious about alleviating fuel poverty. But if we are, we should ask the government two things. First of all, we need to point out, and I'm sorry to say it, green taxes on the essentials of life, and fuel is one of them, costs lives. And this year, more people are going to die potentially because of the taxes, the green taxes on domestic fuel. Uh, and so it, on that basis, it would make more sense for the taxes to be transferred to general taxation and not have these taxes on the essentials of life at a time when the people in this country, for reasons we all know about, are going to struggle, struggle, and many people are going to suffer great hardship and there will be an increase of deaths. The second point is, and it's been well made in some quarters, that we should be lobbying the government for, a, for the removal of VAT on domestic fuel. So what I would say, uh, Chairman, is either we're serious about fuel poverty or we're not. And if we're serious about fuel poverty, we should be asking the government to remove taxes, green taxes that are directly on the essentials of life and to remove the VAT on domestic fuel. Now, if uh, Councillor Milne was prepared to amend his, uh, uh, his uh, motion to that effect, I might feel able to support it. But I think that's a big problem. And as I indicated earlier, the government is going to give local authorities some real powers in this field. And so, apart from anything else, I, I fear the timing of this motion is wrong too. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Council. Anyone else want this question? Oh, yeah, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to respond to Councillor Circus's two points. He says it's the wrong time, but the climate emergency is now, and the that squeeze on people's cost of living is now. We need to start now. Great if we get more powers later and we can accelerate and act more efficiently, but we should not be delaying. The second point is that if we want to deal with this, removing the, removing costs from the uh, fuel bills to encourage people to spend more on fuel is entirely counterproductive here. Obviously, people on low incomes need to be able to afford uh, the minimum amount of, or a good amount of fuel to be able to live a good life. But if you lower prices wholesale, you're encouraging people who are already burning too much fuel to continue to burn too much fuel and to increase it. So this is not the way forward. Insulation is a win-win. It, it helps people's standard of living because they, it costs them less. It helps the climate. And it also makes homes more comfortable. Thank you very much, Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Wright. Thank you, uh, Chair. I have the uh, privilege of being the Cabinet Member not only for the environment but for rural affairs. And I think, as uh, we've made very clear, that this Cabinet's... Uh, key priority is the environment and that embodies every decision that we make including the council's strategy to meet net zero by 2030 so we do take this incredibly seriously i feel like councillor milne is being slightly disingenuous as uh, uh i we missed my last two pdags on the environment and has not raised this issue with me before this meeting and if this was a burning issue that we he really genuinely cared about the people of Warsham, he might well have done that rather than brought it here today to score political points. As I have said, this is an issue that is a key at the heart of this Cabinet's uh, agenda, the environment and fuel poverty. We want Horsham to be a great place to live, not only for those who can afford to live here, but those who can't as well. Um, as I said, I'm the Cabinet Member for, for the Rural Affairs, and this smacks of pure urbanism. 
Um, if you look at, I've lived in four houses in the last five years in a rural district like Whiston, and um, as a rural ward like Whiston, and uh, the, the, the EPC ratings of these old properties, many hundreds of years old, um, are low. And they are low because they are incredibly expensive to bring up. I, I rented those properties, so if this policy was to go ahead, my landlord would be unable to rent them to me, further exacerbating a rural housing crisis that we have because you know rural housing is expensive, but that is where the jobs are. So I cannot support this policy for those reasons already stated. But thirdly as well, this is not how we make policy as a council, as Councillor Croker has brought this evening, the task and finishing group, which has taken months to go through, has interviewed many people, has created best practice for the council. That is how we make decisions based on evidence. We do the research and just bringing a motion forward to council with only a week's notice is not how we should make evidence. So you may think that it is some idea that we bring it to a PDAG to discuss it, as to, to, to wash it away, but that's not the case. We make decisions based on evidence and that is discussed through PDAGs. So I will, um, you know, I, I, I don't think I can say anything more other than that it's just cheap political point scoring at the uh, expense of the residents. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I hear what Councillor Milne says about um, he doesn't want this deferred in any shape or form. But, you know, it's, it's far, it covers far too many portfolios, really, to, to discuss it within, as councillors, well, the chairman has said, 30 minutes. So I do propose the following, and um, I thank you for your motion, and it is an important, diverse and complex nature that does affect more than one aspect of our council's responsibilities. I'm therefore going to propose the following, as I do feel that much of what it raises is too important to discuss this evening within the time frame, but rather merits further investigation and seeking of factual information to all councillors when this has been undertaken. I do assure members that they will be appraised of this information, and I'm happy to make a, a proposal, of, or a, I'm happy to make a suggestion that within three or four months' time, we will bring it back to council with proper, proper information. Thus, I'd like to put forward the following motion. Due to the complexity and depth of the subject matter, it is felt that this should be deferred to the relevant policy advisory development groups, a board, sorry, to be discussed and considered fully. I therefore recommend this in accordance with 4A28F of the Council's Constitution. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Uten. I, I take it you're proposing an amendment to the motion. Is that right? I'm proposing, no, not an amendment. I'm proposing that we actually defer it to Councillor Skin. And I do have a second one. Okay. In uh, F, it says an amendment to a motion. Oh, sorry. I should refer to my monitoring officer. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, the reference um, that um, our cabinet member has, has just quoted um, is actually classed as an amendment to the motion. So it's, it's just clarifying. Um, it is classed as, as an, an amendment to the motion. Um, and as the chairman was about to say, we will be just that. Um, and then that becomes the substantive, substantive Chairman, without further debate, I'm happy to make my um, statement now. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, this has already been quite a long meeting, um, and I don't believe there's enough time now to make policy this evening. So for that reason, I'm suggesting that we support Councillor Utan's proposal 
Um, and I'm pleased that she said that she can bring it back to this council within three to four months. Um, I think we also need some legal advice on what we can and can't do as a local authority. Um, for that reason, I'm prepared to second that motion. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you very much. Well, as it, as it uh, stated in the Constitution, and I emphasise this, um, there is no further debate. And therefore, um, it is very much for you to, to vote on this. Uh, and I'll take a vote now. So all those in favour of the amendment um, which is being put forward, please show. So on the figures that I have, uh, it would appear that the, um, the amendment is carried uh, and therefore Chairman, I just wanted to say something before you close the meeting. Yes, I've got several people who want to say things before I close the meeting. Um, we haven't quite come to the point of order. We haven't quite come to the end of the agenda. Sorry, point of order. May I? We, if you've point. got a point of order. Yes, just a question. Um, forgive the new question from a newbie. Still, when we've just agreed to refer this to PDAGs, which PDAGs would handle that? Very well. I, I suspect that it will be Councillor you. Uh, yes, thank you. It affects the Housing and Policy Development Group. It affects the Environment and Rural Mental. Um, uh, so, I'm so sorry. It affects the rural, Environment and Rural um, PDAG, and it also affects the planning. So it's three that are affected by the, um, the matters brought up in this motion and its seconding. Thank you. Thank you. Further point of order. Does that mean that we've agreed that all three in the next two to four months will review this motion? You know, the, the amendment said that it would be referred to PDAG, and so I would expect that it would probably go to the relevant PDAGs, but uh, perhaps Councillor Chown might like to sort of say something. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think so. Um, as, it, as, as we've stated, we're putting the environment at the front of our agenda, and what, what has been brought up is a very serious issue, and it really is complicated. It might seem that we're um, uh, battering it into the long grass, but we're not. The Cabinet member uh, has made a, a statement. We will bring this back. It will go through the process of all the three PDAGs that are involved, having a discussion about it. But I think it's such a big issue, we will probably try to put it together in some more manageable form so that we clearly understand where Councillor Milne started from and where we're going to actually finish so that it... Uh, looks a bit like what Councillor Proper has done. I don't know if, if we'll send it to scrutiny. Uh, it, it's quite an important issue to us as a, as a, as a council and as a leadership team. So um, what I will do is I will have discussions with my cabinet colleagues and with uh, uh, Councillor Martin Boffey about this, that he feels comfortable in the way that it will progress. I'm not quite sure how we will do it because it does go across three PDAGs and we don't want to get too complicated or too lost. But hopefully when it comes back to full council, it'll come back in a meaningful way that you will understand clearly where we have. And you have that assurance from myself and the cabinet uh, as, as well um, that we will do this as, in the next few months. As, as Councillor Chan has made a statement, does anyone want to make a statement? Um, Chairman, it was very briefly just to say this is your last meeting um, with Council. I've got another, I've got another one um, item to go, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't steal it. <laughs> I will let you finish, Chairman. <laughs> Councillor Robert. Chairman, I'll just take the opportunity as long as we've got you there. Um, I'm open-minded as to where we take this. I welcome that invitation. Um, as Councillor Chan will know, um, 
I would support you bringing this tonight because I want to see this council push the boundaries and be be a leader, as as John said in his speech. Um, we'll have our different opinions about where where the government is at on this issue, but my my concern is that we had an energy strategy come out this year which ignored efficiency, it talked about how we produce energy, not how we use energy, which signalled to me, we're on our own, guys, we've got to deal with this, so there are sometimes limits to what we can do, but let's push them for our people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, I, I'm going to move on to item 14. Uh, members' questions on notice under Rule A, uh, 4A 20B25. Uh, we have received a question on notice from Councillor Ruth Fletcher. You have two minutes in which to ask Councillor Lynn Lambert, Cabinet Member for Planning and Development, your question. Thank you. I appreciate that the evening's getting on. Statements have been made to the press and in public forums that suggest that some, or possibly all, of the strategic sites proposed in the new local plan will not go ahead as a side effect of the water neutrality issue. Can you confirm which sites, if any, are definitely in or definitely out? The full list of strategic sites is west of Ifield, Kingsfold, west of Southwater, west of Billingshurst, east of Billingshurst, Buckbarn, Adversane and Mayfield near Henfield. Rookfield, sorry, Rookwood was one of the sites but has previously been withdrawn by HDC. Can you confirm this remains the case? Councillor Lambert. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your question, Councillor Fletcher. Oh. The work on the solution to water neutrality will inform this council on the level of development that the local plan will be able to accommodate. This work is not complete and it is therefore not possible to state which sites can or which sites cannot be included in the local plan at this stage. I can confirm that Rookwood remains unavailable for development. Thank you. Uh, I welcome the uh, answer from the, the Cabinet Member. Um, so, can you assure the Council, given that no sites have been included or excluded, that no further misleading claims will be made, for example, that Buckbarn, Adversane, or any other development, any other site has been saved from development? And further, We've heard from the leader that the water neutrality time scales are likely to be 12 months or more. So could we could you also confirm when we will be hearing about our plans as a council for consulting on further development of the local plan and the time scale for this and any interim guidance which we're going to be publishing? Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. The time scale until we have a mitigation strategy is unknown. We are waiting for mitigation strategy. The mitigation strategy is to enable the development of the local plans in the affected areas. Once we have that mitigation strategy, we will know how many megalitres of water per day will be available for the affected area. This then has to be divvied up between the affected boroughs and districts. We will then know what our uh, portion of that is, and we will then know how many homes this council can develop. Thank you very much. And at the first part of the question, could you, uh, could you assure council that no further misleading claims will be made, for example, at Buckbarn, Adversane, or other sites? have been saved from development. I can't stop people saying whatever they want to say. However, I can assure you that no sites are in, no sites are out, and no sites will be in or out until we have a strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Council Fletcher, you may make a final statement in response of five minutes maximum. Thank you. I am disappointed to hear that uh, a cabinet member is unable to give us an assurance 
that her fellow cabinet members will not continue to make misleading statements about certain sites having been saved to members of the public. I also remain very concerned about the timescales for the local plan, because once the water neutrality has been uh, resolved, then can the you, pressure... Can you, can, can you stop? What's your point of order, Councillor Burgess? There was a statement that cabinet members have been saying these things through to the press. Is there any evidence of that, please? No, this is this is this is not a point of order. Um, point of order is a, is a legal requirement, and I'm not going to take that uh, at this point. I just like. To Thank you. Yes, I, I don't. I don't plan to with, withdraw the comment, um, but I will move on to the rest of my uh, statement, which is to say that I do remain concerned that once the water neutrality issue is resolved, as we all hope it will be as soon as possible, the floodgates will open in terms of development pressure, and that as a council we need to be absolutely ready on the front foot to move forward with the local plan and that we need to be making contingency plans in the meantime so that when we reach that point we are ready to proceed and we may have to do this on a basis of scenario planning according to potential um, new housing numbers of a low, medium or high level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes the, the business of the evening. Did you want to make a statement? I'm not sure that you should be Chairman, I don't want to prolong the meeting any further. This was the first meeting of our new Chief Executive. This is the last meeting that you'll be chairing the, um, in this capacity because the next meeting of this Council is the annual Council meeting and I just wanted to say a great thank you to you for the way you've chaired our Council meetings. Uh, I'm sure everybody would join me in saying the same. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, perhaps I should have taken my advice to Dominic and disappear. <laughs> there is no urgent business, therefore I declare the meeting closed. Thank you. Thank you.